Welcome to an evening with Jim McGowan. As you will be aware, we can't actually film our interview with Jim inside due to COVID restrictions. So we're very appreciative to be able to come here to Northampton Society of Model Engineers at Delapre Park in Northampton to be able to meet Jim outside and do the interview. Jim, thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate that you're doing the evening with and coming over to Northampton so that we could meet outside. Thank you. That's quite all right. I've been enjoying, looking forward to coming and I'm sure we'll enjoy it. So Jim, you're now the very well known owner of Connoisseur Models, producing a range of superb model railway locomotives, wagons, carriage kits, and before we reach that stage of your career, I just wondered if you could take us back and tell us a bit about what started you getting into model making. Right, well, I'd always had an interest in railways ever since a small boy. Uh, basically, uh, we found ourselves as a single parent family uh, when I was around 12, 13 years old. Uh, and that lot. So model making was became very big for me. It was something I could do myself uh, and that lot. So, you know, through as a schoolboy, I was doing double O and sort of slowly progressing myself, uh, an amount of scratch building in plastic art, getting the railway modeler, that sort of thing. Uh, and that, and, but basically in one of the railway modelers, there was a series of articles by David Jenkinson on scratch building coaches, specifically in O gauge, but how to build coaches from Plasticard. And I, I was really taken by that, you know, and, and in sort of, you know, a young teenager's mind, looking at this excellent workmanship, uh, it didn't seem daunting that you couldn't have a go yourself. So I ended up building. A couple of double O gauge coaches following uh, the uh, art article, David Jenkins, where well, you know, perhaps not too bad a job looking looking at, uh, at them uh, for what I was at the age. So that was that. Then again, within the railway modeler, I pick, picked up uh, from the second hand magazine stall at the Great Central Railway. Uh, a, a magazine, a railway modeler, that actually featured the Abbey Road and Barton Bendish Light Railway, uh, which was by Derek, Derek and Peter Featherstone. Uh, and it was a minimum space O gauge model railway, which was an absolute revelation to me uh, and that lot. And from that, I thought, well, I'm going, I could have a go at this. And Initially, I built myself a little lever cabin uh, out of plastic card just, just to get a feel for it. And I thought, I like this old gauge. That's really good. And so pretty much I started building uh, along that way. Very simple model making at the time uh, in sort of the, the early 80s. Uh, and it was in the era of the high fields plastic kits which were uh, plastic uh, vac vacuum form, plastic vacuum form kits uh, and they fitted on the likes of a Lima motor bogey. You'd got the Lima range uh, of sort of affordable O gauge and so I can remember I built myself an outer plastic card, a tram loco to go on a Lima motor bogey uh, and there was the range of 3H kits available, uh, which was cheap, I think, I think, you know, a sort of wagging kit was only a couple of pounds, you know, uh, uh, as opposed to that, you know, a Slater's wagging kit was probably five or six pounds, so you, you, could, you could only build a Slater's wagging kit if you asked for one for Christmas, but, uh, you know, you could have a 3H wagging kit or two, they were sort of affordable and that lot, so, 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 so that was my modelling, and, yeah, I started building the layouts and within Leicestershire, which is where we lived, uh, and that lot, there was quite a network of small exhibitions, uh, school halls, charity events, that sort of thing. Uh, and there was always ways looking for 
layouts to come along to it. So my first sort of O gauge layout was being invited, got invited to these little exhibitions, very amateurish, but you then started to get to, to know other people, uh, and that's sort of how it expanded, so yeah. So you went from double O to O gauge and started in little clubs and things for shows. Did you end up on the wider exhibition circuit? Uh, yes, it widened uh, a little bit, uh, a bit more, and I've I've got an image here of one of my early layouts uh, wow. that I built uh, a map So basically, it, it was a fair effort uh, and started going wider with the uh, local Leicestershire circuit and then there was some invites. In fact, we even ended up uh, over at Aylesworth in uh, East Suffolk, which is where I met the uh, East Anglian lads. But, uh, but with going round the local circuits, also a number of other people was there, so I actually got to know Pete Smith, who's now Kirtley Models, but he was there with uh, double O layout, well, say double O and EM gauge layout at the time, uh, and, that, and there was Kevin Pearson, uh, who got quite heavily involved in organising, later in organising uh, the larger scale shows uh, and that lot, but at that time, Kevin Pearson started organising a small show in Leicestershire at Barrow on Saw, which went for many years and sort of slowly became uh, something within the O-Gage calendar. So yeah, pre pretty much with my efforts, and you was then making the connection with everybody else and uh, that lot, and it really did lay an excellent foundation for, you know, the rest of my life. But at that time, I was actually working, uh, well, I was serving my apprenticeship to, to start with, uh, and then went on into, uh, you know, uh, full-time employment. So can we pick up on that, because that's really timely, actually, to talk about your gainful employment and, and how all that started. You mentioned apprenticeship. Where did that all start and where did it lead to? Right, well, I started apprenticeship, uh, did an apprenticeship, uh, as an electrical engineer with... Uh, an engineering firm in Leicester, uh, which was Bentley Engineering, who actually made hosiery machines, sock machines in effect, uh, although they did merge with a couple of other companies and uh, produce the big knitting machines, uh, the big body machines as well. Uh, so, but my initial uh, start of the apprenticeship uh, was on maintenance, so it was factory maintenance, it was plant and installation, uh, and that lot, which is where I was been. And then slowly, uh, because they tended to move you around as an apprenticeship to serve that lot and where, where you sort of fitted in, I ended up moving over to the electrical production side for producing the control panels and control gear for the, for the, for the machines that were being produced uh, by the firm. The very famous Bentley Comet knitting machine that sort of had ch changed little since sort of the 1920s was still in production and still had basic electrics on it. And the firm had a production department where there was a couple of uh, trained electricians, Wyman type electricians to produce the panels and obviously with everything needing testing, uh, if you've got a prove and test the products at 415 volts, uh, you had to have a level of it. So, so that's how come I got in there uh, as an apprentice. But the main production work was done by three very skilled and very dexterous ladies uh, working on benches and, and they'd do the wire looms, they'd do the print, uh, the printed circuit board assembly, because microprocessors were just being introduced to it. And as an as a, as a insight into a small production department, it was probably absolutely excellent, because you, you'd got these ladies, you'd got your own stores, they was doing the work, they was passing the work between each other, so each person was actually uh, quality control in the work to the next one and that lot. And with, without realising it, it was probably an absolute good wi window on how to be, you know, a small-scale producer of something. Uh, so what about um, 
electrical engineering and the move to actually running your own business. I mean, you mentioned in your title for this evening that you went from Dole, Cr Q, Dole Q to running your own well, business. Do Dole Q to being my own man, I think, is the, yeah. uh, well, was the polite way you uh, then point nudge me towards coming up with <laughs> uh, and that lot. Yes, yeah, ba basically, s served me apprenticeship, fin finished uh, with that and then went on wi within the firm uh, to actually moving from the production side of it uh, to the actual uh, development of the product. So what was tending to happen, they was developing a range of machines, uh, a lot of computer control, very early computer control was coming in uh, and that lot. So it was all expanding the amount of electrical uh, sort of fitting. So what you'd got was some very clever electrical engineers who got BAs in engineering from Cambridge and that lot and they, they'd sort of go up the pub and come back down again and De design what was needed and cobble something together and come wandering out and saying, right, we've got this, can we get the ladies to make it? Can you can you put that in production? And these people was ever so clever, but they didn't really cotton on to actually making something. So so you'd look at it and you think, well, you haven't used two screws the same size there and that sort of thing. So what I ended up doing there was developing the, what the clever fellas had come up with and refining it and trying to make it and simplify it so we could then pass it on to uh, the ladies on the bench but you know it wasn't electrician and a time factor as well uh, it's point what you don't want is an electrical connection that's going to take you five minutes rattling about out of sight with a screwdriver when simply by putting the terminal block on the front you can do the job in 30 seconds uh, and it was that sort of thing so I, I like that as uh, a, a, you know a, a discipline a, uh, that lot of uh, developing it and I always think that that served me far better in future years particularly uh, and that lot coming from an electrical background rather than an engineering background because you know, you speak to engineers and they say, oh, well, we've got to mount that component so we can put you two holes in at those exact hole centres and that will be correct at plus or minus two thousandths of an inch, and, which is all very well. Now, an electrician would say, oh, well, if I have a circular hole and a slotted hole, that component will always fit. And if I have to source a component that almost fits but doesn't quite, it can still be usable. So. The electrical side of it, I think, brings you more of a uh, flexibility that matches up with model making rather than precision engineering. Uh, so, so that's where I was. Uh, but it was a time uh, in the 1980s. Uh, we're sort of moving on, uh, sort of late 85, early 86, uh, where pretty much the political uh, mood of the country or, or whatever was that Britain didn't need to be a manufacturing country and that lot we could uh, exist by the service sector and that lot and, and slowly the engineering industry was contracting and contracting and the company when I served my uh, started my apprenticeship and the firm that uh, Bentley's had merged with Wilt Miller Bromley's I think there was 1600 employees well, by the end of the 80s, I think we was down to about 600. So that was the level of the uh, the contraction. Uh, and I could always remember with doing doing the job uh, of developing these machine the machines in you know experimental research and development. And we'd got a machine and we were sorting out the control panel and and the layout and that lot and. One of the company directors uh, was there, and he, he'd he'd got uh, the the engineer, the you know the engineer with the Cambridge BA and that lot, and he's going, oh, well, I think we need to do this, we need to do that, and that. And, I, and I'm looking, I'm thinking, well, that's all. I says, ah, oh, Mr. Whitaker, what what I think we ought to do is, and I said, Jim, 
You are not paid to think. You are paid to do as you are told. And that lot. And at that point, that, 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 was, that was a bit of it. I thought, no, I don't want to be in this game. I don't want to be a man that's paid to do as he's told. <laughs> and that lot. And, and for some reason, that or, or that point very much soured it for me that I was looking for, for an alternative. Uh, and that lot. And then when the next round of redundancies came out, I, I said, can I go? Uh, because it was a case of if anybody volunteered, they had to go first, as, as such and that lot. Then went to uh, another firm for about three months, uh, which that firm was open for a big order. That order fell through. And again, it was worked on the, and fairly so, on the last in, first out uh, principle. So basically, I found myself unemployed on the doll, joining the doll queue. Jim, you've, you've ended up on the doll queue. Um, what on earth did you think about doing next? Building an O-Gage exhibition layout. What <laughs> What else could you do? Of uh, that lot. So, yes, uh, uh, I started building a little bit more of a light railway layout in uh, in O-Gage. Uh, and that lot. But uh, an absolute ideal time. And I kept thinking, oh, I'll just have a week or two and do this and then I'll look for a job and then I thought no oh, that was enjoyable I'll just have another couple of weeks and that lot because uh, and that was good well at that time uh, they was well over three million on the doll so they seemed to take the attitude of if you were sort of happy and quite peaceful where you was they left you alone because if it's three, if it's three million unemployed and no jobs to go round, why start hassling people? So uh, so I had six months, and, and they pretty much left you alone. And then after six months, they started putting a little bit of pressure on uh, on you to go and do something, uh, and that lot. And I can remember being called in for, for an interview at uh, the Dole Centre, at Loughborough Job Centre, and uh, sort of going in and sitting down and, you know... Uh, I suppose the people that was there must have been a bit of a soul-destroying job, uh, getting people in, knowing you've, you've not really got a lot to offer people anyway, and that lot of a fella started going through, uh, and that lot, and he's looking at my file, and he said, well, you're an electrician. Have you ever thought of self-employment? And my ears sort of pricked up a bit. And I said, yeah, he said, well, we've got this scheme called the Enterprise Allowance. Uh, and it was a scheme that it paid £40 a week for a year for you to go and set up your own business. Uh, and it also offered an amount of mentoring. It offered an amount of training uh, in basic business skills and that lot. Uh, an amount of mentoring. Uh, but really... It was a much maligned scheme, or much criticised, that it was just a way for the government of the day to fiddle the unemployment figures uh, and that lot. It, because it took every, you know, if you went on it, you was taken off the unemployment figure. But oh, I thought, well, this could be just the thing for me. Uh, and so I said, yes, yes, I'd like to do it. Oh, electrician? No, model maker. I'd like to become a model maker. Now... Uh, pretty much, obviously, doing model making, you, you was buying your stuff from uh, small businesses. In some ways, what was available in O-Gage was very much the preserve of small businesses and part-time businesses uh, and that lot. So you could see the example of those that was making it work. Uh, and you sort of thought, well, or I thought to myself, well, yeah, you know, could, could we try it? So... Uh, Oh, so I signed up for, for the course, and, and that's pretty much how we started. So, did you actually start model making for yourself, or did you think about selling to customers at that stage? Right, well, that's where I was thinking that uh, um, there, there was examples around uh, that used to come along to some of the smaller uh, shows and that lot, but they've got this small range of uh, products. I, I mean... 
in, within sort of the Leicester East Midlands area, you've got the likes of Ian Cherry, uh, who was there with quite a bespoke uh, service of Finnish models, of Finnish locomotives, that lot for for sort of people. But it was also uh, Ian Longdon with the Janet range, uh, and he had a range of again providing a lot of bespoke finished models for people but he had also a range of kits uh, and that which many of his finished models were derived from his kits so th there was examples of perhaps a possible direction to go in uh, but obviously of course for myself I was coming at it literally with no money whatsoever uh, and also coming at it with no family back in no sort of family financial back in or support be because of the nature of it it wasn't there it didn't exist uh, so kits initially didn't figure in my mind because uh, of well no way of really financing them or, or not not that lot initially i got an art the idea of providing finnish built models for people uh, but Having no money, I really had to look towards adding maximum value between the material costs and what I could sell something for. So, you know, the easiest way was to do commission building for people, you know, oh, I'll build your kit, I'll build you. Uh, so I, I started advertising that I, I do that. Uh, also scratch building again you're using very cheap materials plus a lot of time to hopefully come up with a product that's got a lot of added value uh, to it uh, and and another area was the copper clad point work was something that for an amount of time uh, i could quickly put relatively inexpensive materials into a finished product uh, and, and at that time, they were, there was a fantastic fellow called Steve Maris, uh, who had a set of products, who traded as Waverley, uh, and, that, and he produced a range of point kits, uh, very well thought of in the O-Gage circles uh, at the time, uh, and they was copper clad, but while he produced for kits, he didn't want to produce finished point work so Steve used to supply me with the components at a sweet and advantageous price so one of the products I initially developed was a range of point work and that went for a number of years the point work was being sold for two people as well as making it for yourself or were you concentrating on a customer building up a customer base now right well the, the, the point work itself a range of point work uh, was something I could have on the stand and available and ready to sell to people you know oh yes I want to double slip and two left hand points you could hand them over that'll be I can't remember the prices now but shall we say that'll be 40 pounds uh, but but it was a product that i could have to sell uh plus it led on to people wanting individual point work built uh you know so it was sort of oh can you do as a three-way point to this uh in actual fact i never really managed to build enough of specialist three-way point to have in stock because they were always snapped up uh, so the more unusual but again it, it was a product that I could produce at a reasonable cost uh, and I also started building a lot of rolling stock uh, kits and again I've got very early Gage O'Gill Gazette uh, and this is an advert from it of and built rolling stock uh, which i was uh, advertising and it was mainly based around the kits produced by adrian swain abs models which were white metal kits again they was very cheap or, or very, very reasonably priced they, they very cleverly produced was the abs kits to produce a really nice product uh 
at a very basic material cost. When you looked at what Adrian had done, a very clever bloke, uh, and it meant that I could buy his kits, assemble them as a finished, ready-to-run wagon, and probably manage to sell it for four times the cost of the kit. Uh, all right, a lot of time put in, uh, and that. But it meant I could have a range of products on the stand to actually sell direct to people. Uh, the other area was people coming along, oh, I've got a kit, can you build it? Can you do me a, a finished, ready-to-run model from what I've got? Which sounded like a fantastic business opportunity, uh, if you think of it, because you, you think, well, customer's coming along, he's purchased, or he's got all the outlay of what he's purchased, he's brought your pro the stuff to you, all you've got to do is build it, finish it, and then take, charge him the money, and, uh, and that's all profit. The only trouble is, as you was, if, certainly if you was new to it as well, what the first lot of customers you attracted was everybody that nobody else wanted to deal with because they'd perhaps got kits that they wanted building and they were some of the worst kits out. They was, and certainly back in the 80s, O-gauge kits were a very, very mixed bag uh, and that lot. So trouble was, you get somebody coming along, oh, can you build us three off wagging kits from, uh, and that lot, and you sort of think, oh yeah, well, you know, 50 pound or whatever, an off wagging kit, you give them a price. And you get these kits. And you then find that there was so much wrong with the kits. You had to do so much work to get them together and that lot. You'd be thinking to yourself, well, I think I've worked for 50p an hour here by the time of it uh, and that lot. So very, very soon I realised that there's no way you could find a living way, or, or no way I could find a living wage from building from some of the bad kits uh, that was available. You had to know your product uh, for doing it. So. As I was going on and sort of establishing myself, it became fairly obvious that if I could design some kits myself, no matter how good or bad a job I did of them, at least I'd know where all the errors were and know how to put them right, and at least I'd know what I'd doing. So that's pretty much how the kits first started, uh, or the idea of producing kits was more to produce a set of parts that I could build ready to runs from and possibly sell a few kits if there was any interest after after that. It's a huge learning curve by the sound of things and interesting times. Do you remember the first kit that you actually designed and decided to start with? Right, yes. Uh, again, looking at a very early gazette, I found an advert uh, for my first three kits, uh, which appeared in the Gazette, but the first of them was actually the Great Western Railway McCaw B, Bogey Bolster. Now, by pure chance, uh, although this, and this is one that was produced, uh, one of, must have been one of the first ones in 1989, I packed up looking at the packaging, and I was given this about 18 months ago by Big John Taylor who'd actually took it in as a second-hand product from uh, a customer a, a, against something. And he said to me, he says, well, I've got this. How, how old is it? And I said, John, I never kept any of my original stuff. Because, you know, a, a lot of things you don't understand the relevance or, you know, at the time, or it's most important that you sell it for money to the customer. I said, can I have that from him? And so... This is one of the original ones, lovely box label, done by good friend Pete Smith, who's now currently models for it, and that was the first kit, the Great Western uh, McCaw B. I, if memory serves me right, I think when we did a, a guild ex at Bletchley uh, in 1988, I think I would got them available as ready to run. They provided me with the ready to run, but I don't think it was actually available as a kit then. Or if it was, it was probably in a very basic format as a kit. But I remember that it, it proved very popular as a ready to run model, but it was something that one, I could produce from my own products 
uh, at my own cost price, but it wasn't a perfect kit. But I knew I knew exactly where you needed to just file a little bit or open an all out, so I could actually produce a finished model fairly quickly with it. So, yep, that was the first. Wow. And it's so wonderful that you've managed <laughs> to actually get yourself a, 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 a one that you can have now as your a historical sort of memories of that start. Well, I must admit, I did have a little tear in my eye when Big John produced it and said, is this of any interest to you? Yeah. I also found, while well, looking in the cupboards, this, which was a cast white metal kit uh, that was produced for a period of time. Uh, again, a Dumbuford wagon kit, but I, I had a small range uh, of white metal kits that was produced using Plasticard as the masters. Uh, thinking back to Andy Duncan's An Evening With, where he showed the pattern making and the mould making and the vulcanising process, the first castings that we was having produced uh, for the kits, I was going to a lady up in Derby who'd set up with a small casting machine to supply uh, castings and uh, operate as a contract caster. And all her moulds was made from a liquid silicon rubber. So it was a liquid rubber that they mixed an ordner in and they made mould. It meant you could use anything for the pattern making. So Plasticard was an ideal material because that is where I come from. You know, my early scratch building, you know, as a young teenager, sort of 16 onwards and that lot, working with Plasticard. Uh, so, yeah, it... Uh, a small range of white metal wagons uh, as well, which was very much my second kit. Uh, and my first locomotive kit was a Y7 040, uh, which, if memory serves me right, I think it sold for £48 initially, which was quite a jump with O-Gage of getting stuff affordable to people. Uh, in some ways previously, O-Gage was, was a case of the Lima, the high fields, the plastic uh, end of it, which was perhaps the, the affordable cheaper. But as soon as you moved into metal models and metal kits, you sort of moved into a different category and sort of appealed to, you know, the, the money retired major from the pay core or something. And the idea of more simple loco kits being available uh, at an affordable price uh, found it found a very ready market. Mm. So can you explain the basic concept of a etched brass kit? Because you've moved from white metal into the brass. How do you actually set about making an, an etched brass kit? Right, well the, the heart of the etch brass kit, the art of the etching process, uh, is the fact that the tooling, there is no hard tooling. The tooling is actually a set of photographic print, printing plates, not dissimilar uh, to uh, uh, book printing plates uh, and that lot. The, the process is actually from the jewellery trade, uh, and that was pretty much the etchers bread and butter, uh, producing clock faces, intricately cut clock fingers, all, all sorts of that. Uh, I had, was slightly familiar. My way into the etching process was actually from the electrical printed circuit boards, where it used a not dissimilar process uh, of producing a pair of films, a pair of tools. Uh, now, in the printed circuit board side, the tools were actually produced directly by laying out on, on a drawing board uh, uh, and that lot, where with the photo etching, it was actually a piece of graphic artwork that was at that time taken in and put on the copy camera to basically produce 
a pair of neg a pair of positives uh, that was joined down the middle and could be folded together as two sheets of paper. Uh, that. The actual material, the brass sheet or whatever, was coated with a resist, uh, which was a photographic emulsion. So the sheet of metal would be placed between the pair of photo tools, exposed to strong light, and then developed as a photograph. And basically where the light, I think I've got this right, where the light has it the emulsion or the photographic resist emulsion, it hardens. Where the light hasn't uh, it it, it still remains soft. Then when the sheets are developed, all the soft bit is removed, so you get a sheet of brass that has got an acid resist both sides of it, which has been printed on or produced on by the photographic process. This sheet is then passed through the etching machine. Now the etching machine is a roller bed, uh, a bed of rollers, and the etching acid, ferric chloride, is actually sprayed on so you've got a spray so they pass through perhaps removes two or three foul of material of brass in passing literally eat, eating it away with the etching process so with our etches that we're used to seeing they'll etch from both sides so they'll pass through once take three foul off the top fell at the other end of the machine or lift it off come round put it in, turning the sheet over possibly, to etch another three foul from the back, and they'll keep this up until the uh, materials literally etch through, pierce through, and then you'll hopefully have your, uh, have your tracery of all your etch parts. Right. So do you do most of the kit making yourself? How much is it your input in your kit? Right, uh, I produce all the artwork uh, for the etching to, for the etching tools to, to be made from. In the traditional way, that was a piece of artwork that went into the etchers, and the etchers had a copy camera similar to a newspaper uh, firm would have a copy camera or whatever. And that piece of physical artwork was put on, photographed, and the etching tools are produ was produced off it. Now much of it has moved to digital, so people are creating them in AutoCAD, uh, uh, Illustrator, that sort of program. Myself, I'm still taking in a physical piece of pasted up artwork. Not produced in the, in the traditional way of sitting down at the drawing board with your rotary pens and starting at one corner and working, working out, the artwork is produced in a different way. But I still like the idea of taking in a physical piece of artwork to go on the copy camera. Uh, but that's all my work. The producing of the tools, no, that has to be done by the etchers because of the nature of it, be it done digitally or original. Uh, and I'm going to say I don't think there is a model railway manufacturer in Britain that do their own etching work. Everybody uses a contract etcher because of the nature of what it is. Uh, the local council will probably get rather upset about ferric chloride going down your, your drains at home if you was doing it in, in the shed. So I've, I've produced it, the etchers produce the etchings for me, I go and collect them that is obviously the heart of the kit as well uh, and that. Now what parts can't be produced as a flat fabrication as an etching, the 3D parts, chimney dome, that sort of thing, are going to need to be a casting uh, and that. And again there's various ways of producing the castings. I produce my own white metal casting uh, in a not dissimilar way to Andy Duncan of the evening with uh, of that lot, uh, and I've got 
my own casting equipment, or I have had my own casting equipment for many years, uh, and so that gives me full control of that part of the, the, the process. Uh, the instructions I've always done myself, and I, I've tried to make them almost the heart of the kit, uh, and in some ways develop it as a sort of unique selling point uh, of the instructions. Uh, and those, again, I produced myself uh, from, from the very early days. Uh, I got my own photocopier. That was quite a leap forward and enabler to have your own photocopier. And so pretty much I've physically done all the printing. Uh, in the early days, it was a traditional of a drawing board, pen and ink, isometric exploded drawings uh, and ri ribbon typewriter written instructions that was pasted up. Uh, an absolute uh, liberating experience to me was the computerised, the desktop publishing that meant that the computers could, uh, that the instructions could be computer produced and edited and that. And then the last thing were, was the introduction of digital images, so the ability to go step by step, photo, build instructions, and that has very much opened things up. As a young man with my first van, the first thing that you did was you went down and you bought your Ains Workshop manual uh, to try and do your maintenance on it, and those original Ains Workshop manuals, you'd open them up and they'd explain to you of how to strip down the starter motor in you know, step-by-step photos and that lot. And, and in my mind I'd always had that as being the benchmark of how you should produce instructions. Uh, and in some ways if you look at my latest instructions that have sort of made use of the desktop publishing and the digital imagery, hopefully you can look and think, ah, oh, I can see Jim as a young man looking at those odd black and white images in the Ains manual and that's what I've carried as a benchmark with me. Yeah. Yeah. So you've just talked about the importance of instructions and the Haynes manuals. You do have a reputation for fantastic kits for beginners and as the person who is new to O-Gage I said to John what sort of kit should I buy for a first brass kit? And the immediate response was, get a Mac L from Jim. And I can still remember coming and seeing you at a York show and buying my very first brass kit, which is in front of you now. Um, did you actually, I know the Haynes manuals are important, but did you actually set out thinking, I want it to be easy for beginners? Right, well, I first I'll say, I think you've made as nice a job of that as anybody would want to get. So, obviously, it's done the business, which is what it should be. Right. No, I didn't set out to produce models for beginners, but because I'd got so limited resources, money-wise, the first kits I produced had to be simple because that's all I could afford to do. Uh, and I suppose simple kits then was just naturally attraction or it was a natural place for the beginners to come so it, like so much in fact I think pretty much everything in business uh, the directions very much been led by the customer uh, and heck whatever I've planned never gone that way <laughs> anyway but uh, so so what I was finding is I was getting a lot of beginners coming on and it's a, it's a lovely part of the market to be trying to cater for. Uh, I, I don't think I'd be very good trying to produce top-end stuff for the rivet counter uh, because they'd probably come along and tell me what is wrong with the kit, my uh, shortcomings, my lack of knowledge, where the beauty of a beginner bringing along a model like this, all they want to do is tell you how much they have enjoyed building it and then ask you what they can spend the money with on. 
and buy next time. So it's it's a lovely it's a lovely place to be, and it's it's a place I've got a tremendous amount of satisfaction over the years as well. Uh, I mean, what does get, what does get me is there was modellers that had their first kit off me 30 years ago and I'm looking at what they're producing now and hell there's a lot better modellers than me now <laughs> you know I look at some of my customers and think well you're a better modeler than I am uh, but you know that's a nice compliment in its way but if they've bought a kit like I did my first brass kit and it's given them a great deal of satisfaction and they've been able to do it without a lot of frustration then you do want to go on and build something else and build something else so in many ways you're having a major impact on junior modelers and novice modelers and encouraging them into the hobby well yes uh i've never i've never managed to get my head round the idea of selling somebody a pile of junk because <laughs> i'm thinking well you'll only get their money once <laughs> They'll not come back to you again. Uh, and the thing is, if we can get somebody in and we build a simple wagon, get them onto a, a brake van, get them onto their first loco, get get them in. Not only are they a new customer, what I've tended to find is we go around and tell four or five of their mates. And I can end up with five or six new customers. Mm. You know, it... It just makes sense to try, uh, to me it makes complete sense to try and sort somebody out right. Uh, you know, it, it, it makes, you know, pure, you know, it makes business sense, but it, it also makes sense in the satisfaction uh, from, from you doing it, uh, point of view. So, as I said, I was pointed to you for my first brass kit, and I notice on the forum and on Facebook, even now, if somebody says, I want to buy my first brass kit in O-Gage, everybody says, go to Jim, go to Connoisseur. What is it about it? Oh, uh, well, I'm very pleased they do. I think this model that you've got here is a perfect example uh, of why go to me and why that works so successfully because yes you're directed to me I tend to suggest a low machine wagon and I've got a goodly number in my range as a first one because of the nature of what it is it's easy to build as an etch kit uh, and that lot but it's it's off, it's its potential as well so you've got the wagon but you can make it into a model in its own right and this is a perfect example of what you've done so you've got your load fit but then that brings up the question you need a load for it well there's an opportunity then for me to take the customer that's only hopefully pleased with his wagon and send him over to the likes of andy duncan or one of the other suppliers for a load for it so they then it's broad and it they're having a go at white metal construction with this but not necessarily uh, as running parts of white metal just as a cosmetic parts so of that then there's the opportunity to chain it down as you've done the opportunity to go and deal with the transfers to send you to the paint for you people and that look so <coughs> with the one simple wagon hopefully it's bringing business to me but it gives me the opportunity to then feed the customer round some of the other excellent producers and good good fellows within the uh, O-Gage. Uh, and it broadens it all out. Uh, and so it hopefully becomes a circle that just keeps going round and round with customers feeling a, a sense of satisfaction, a pleasant challenge from each of their projects. So we've talked a bit about, you know, being an apprentice, electrical engineer, being made redundant, and then doing the enterprise scheme and starting your own business, right through to the success that you are now. What obstacles have there been? Uh, the biggest one has been workspace. I, I mean, one... Oh, 
obstacle, or you could say my main obstacle was no money. Having no capital behind me, everything had to be financed as I went along. Uh, you had to earn the money for the next project. Uh, so it tended to be three steps forward, two steps being knocked back two steps. Uh, and that. One of the biggest uh, knockbacks, so to speak, uh, was where you work from. Originally, I started working out of my mum's garage. Uh, that was great, uh, but the trouble is I outgrew it, uh, and I think she got thoroughly sick of me <laughs> in there. Uh, so I actually moved to commercial workspace, uh, and the first place I went to was a place called the Springboard Centre uh, in Colville. It was a, it was actually the uh, old railway wagon works or the colliery wagon works uh, there. But uh, in the early 80s, the mining industry uh, was being shut down, and Colville, as its name, big mining centre, the pits closed, uh, and the government at the time put an amount of money into creating new employment opportunities for miners. And one of the things we did was they converted the old wagon works into little craft studios and places so that, you know, these big, bur well, li little short burly miners and that lot would all come and get a little job, uh, get a little studio and become sculptures and things like that to uh, find their employment. So, that obviously didn't work for the miners, but as a place to be able to get a small unit, uh, in effect the one I got was 300 square foot, uh, and uh, to then provide a workplace, uh, it, it was an option. So I moved in there, but that was when I first met the world of commercial overheads. And Model railway businesses, certainly at the level I was at at the time, and the level I really only ever wanted to be at, don't really generate the sort of income to exist that well in the commercial world. Uh, so I found it a struggle to find each monthly uh, rent and rates uh, and that lot. Uh, so, a possible solution was Jim Harris of Oakville Models was all, had also set up, uh, he'd come off the dole and set up as kit producing uh, at roughly the same time as me and we worked a lot together. Jim was facing uh, a similar thing that uh, he needed somewhere to work from beyond the domestic environment. Uh, and. He hit on the idea of getting a large works, large workspace uh, unit, thousand or so square feet, uh, and dividing it up and getting two or three people to come in, and we, we'd all share the cost because on paper you could rent a thousand square foot in a slightly dodgy industrial unit in a rundown area for not much more than you could rent 300 square foot in a sort of crafty studio environment. So the next move was to, to move in and share a unit with Jim Harris and funny enough another, th so I took about a third of a unit, Jim had got about a third to half of a unit and the rest, uh, Paul Tatum who uh, set up Oldbury models at the other part of the unit. So for a couple of years there was the three of us in this unit and getting by but again the commercial overheads of the reality of it was always sapping your profits and leaving you with very little money to do the next stage of development and that lot so pretty much the solution I came up with was to, with my partner at the time, Megan, I've been in, uh, 
to actually buy an house that we could work from within the house, uh, which was sort of easier said than done because I'd still got very little money. Uh, it was in the days you went down and seen the bank manager uh, and sort of explain what you want. And it was all de always dead keen until you mentioned self-employed and uh, that lot. And at the time, you needed to come up with 20% uh, by way of a deposit before they'd entertain a, a mortgage uh, and your profits, your annual profit was calculated on an average of three years uh, uh, I'm going to say net profit, gross profit and that lot so it, it was quite an hurdle you had to jump through uh, to actually get a mortgage for somewhere uh, even though at the time you could point to what your commercial overheads, commercial rent was costing you and the separate flat we was renting as well, you sort of pointed to it and said, well, I got there's two mortgages worth there that's going out each month. Oh, well, no, sir, we can't take that into account right now. But, you know, uh, worked through it, came up with the money and managed to buy an house that was big enough to accommodate the business with, within it. I mean, I've always said that I never had any money until I got a mortgage. Uh, but that seemed to change everything round because then the bulk of your efforts, even though there was lots of bills against it, they was your bills or it was your assets that you was acquiring with them rather than sort of, in the days of working out of commercial premises, you'd look at it and you think to yourself, well, I've worked Monday to Wednesday to pay all the bills for somebody else. Thursday and Friday, I might see some profit for myself. Uh, so it completely changed the equation, producing the kits from our own space, our, which was the domestic house. Uh, and that served well for about 13 years. Uh, but it also felt like I'd broken through some sort of barrier of, of the business of actually being viable and so it, we grew and grew and as soon as you broke through the barrier it seemed every step was a step forward big steps, little steps or whatever but they were steps forward uh, so it made a real difference being able to work from home r remove that commercial overheads and that lot the disadvantage of working from home which sort of did for nigh on 13 years, is you never go home from work and you just fill the house with it. I'm amazed that Megan put up with it uh, as long as she did. But the thing was, you'd sit watching the telly and behind the telly would be the photocopier and all the uh, uh, sort of office machinery and that one. And you'd sit there and think, oh, I'm not much bothered with this. Oh, no, I'll just go and photocopy some catalogues that you need doing and that. Look. Or as you went upstairs to bed, Every stair would have a different level of kits laid out to help the packing and as an overflow and that lot. So, got to the point where wanted to get somewhere with the workspace separate and about 10 years ago, 2009, moved down to Herefordshire and actually had the perfect, just what's needed for the job in producing uh, model making workshop separated away it's 10 meters from the front door but it's amazing how you can shut the door of the workshop go that t 10 meters away and you've gone home from work you've locked one thing away and come back and that has made all the difference now uh, and it, it really is. You can you can live anywhere, but if you, you're going to turn out decent work, you need a decent workspace. And I'm hoping that what we've got will serve for many years to come. That's excellent. So, this long journey, are you satisfied with your product? Yes. Y yes, I am. Uh, I've now reached the point, uh, I'm going to bring this in, this is the Southern O2, which I think was the first 
kit where all the elements came together and I thought to myself yes that is what I've been trying to produce now many many years ago when I first started uh, and I was doing the model building and I spoke about the poor quality kits that people had asked you to build I was very fortunate that a customer came along and asked me to build some Vulcan pannier tanks for him uh, I think I ended up building three of the different variations and the Vulcan kit that was produced by Eric Undrill I always took as the benchmark they was an absolute excellent product uh, it was as if every aspect be it the parts the etchings the instructions they was a thing of the time of the mid 1980s but as if they tried to do the best job of each of those and you know I all the time in producing the kits I'd always thought poor oh, if I can ever produce something that's somewhere near a match of a Vulcan kit I'll be happy and whether that they'd agree with me or not you know, I finally did the O2 I sort of sat back and thought right that is exactly the product I want to be presenting to people it's qu it's quite a combination uh, the etching process always been happy with it from the early days the white metal casting again uh, happy with it but the white metal castings rely on pattern making in the early days I had to do the best I could perhaps mates would do a bit for you uh, and that lot this was a kit where I had the opportunity because I'd got the resources to actually go along the pattern making the bulk of the pattern making uh, is Tony Hunter uh, with a little bit of Alan Searle that has gone in for things like the Western House pump and that lot but it was one of the first kits that I literally went along to and said well this is the specification can you make to a specification rather than a price so again the castings the quality is all what's needed and with the instructions again the desktop publishing I think I got to grips with the image manipulation program and the desktop publishing the digital camera and the technology had moved on uh, and that to the point that the instructions again uh, I spoke of the Ames manual and the step by step and it's all available to you know, a photographer of little skill I mean I've not got a natural photographic skill but the technology is such that, that you can do it now I it's no great cleverness on my part but almost by attrition and just slowly working through all the elements have come together and I'm so so satisfied with the product now I just hope the customers are no, I think I think that <laughs> goes without saying it's um, wonderful to be able to spend the evening with you and talk to you about it and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions on the night because people do always say you know connoisseur models great kits and you know you should be very pleased with that reputation I am. I mean, the thing is, over the years, a lot of good and generous people have offered me helping hands, uh, which I've been very grateful for. Uh, and much of it, it's for customers have shaped where I've gone, uh, and it's 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 so nice to do something and feel my own, you're your own man, you know. It's, it's nice to think that you're being paid to think. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm just going to finish off with one question. Where do you go from here? What are the plans for the future, Jim? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Uh, there's other kits in the pipeline from, from a pure producing kits 
shall we say, we've got the five-year plan, uh, uh, and I took an artwork into the etchers uh, just over a month ago for a, a new kit. Uh, it was a traditional pasted up artwork, uh, which I took it in. Uh, the comment from the etchers was, heck, we haven't used the copy camera for a year. I hope the film's still good. But they seem very pleased to do this job as a traditional one. Hopefully it won't be the last traditional uh, photo tooling job that they do there. Uh, and that, So there's new kits planned. Uh, so that's just the natural sort of progression. Uh, I, I know I'm going to have to carry on uh, producing products. Uh, basically, I've got no pension uh, or, or anything from that. So I've got no real option except to, keep, to continue working at something until I drop. Uh, now, I was talking a little while back uh, to one of my Dutch customers and we mentioned pensions and private pensions and how poor the British were compared to the Dutch and uh, he turned around and he said, ah oh, Jim, but uh, having to carry on producing O-Gage kits is not a great hardship. Okay. And I thought, well you've got me there, I can't argue with that. So, got to produce something. Uh, I've got the two girls uh, at the moment, nine and ten. Uh, oh, whether they'll want to get involved uh, at a level as time goes on, I don't be would. Uh, what I f pleased I've got is the workspace that if they do ever wish to work for themselves, no matter what it is, be it jewellery work or, or whatever, they won't have to struggle with commercial workspace. Uh, we, we've got the facilities, they'll, they'll have a place to work and pursue what they want. Uh, hopefully they'll want to perhaps get involved in the business. Uh, Pippa was looking uh, just before Christmas as I was doing my books to, to get into the accountant and she was asking me, well how do you do this, what's that? And that lot. I was quite surprised how uh, she sort of asked at it and she sort of pointed she said well why do you do your books this that way because I'm still very traditional and everything's written down in paper form and ledgers and I said oh, I said to her I said oh well you can point to any one of those and that will tell you what that transaction was and I can find the invoice and I can tell you everything about it and she sort of went and she pointed to something and I said oh that's it and it was about the only one we couldn't find, and I thought, well, it's a good job you wasn't the tax man. I'll sort of been in trouble. You know, may, maybe the children will sort of get involved and actually organise me and take me into the digital age. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think there's got, hopefully going to be plenty for the future, uh, and hopefully with the Gage O' Guild, uh, still be able to provide the marketplace, the tabletop. I, I mean... I don't think it would have been possible to have built the business if the marketplace hadn't have been provided by the clubs, the exhibitions, uh, and that lot. And one thing the last year has told is, has really shown up, that although, yes, online sales and that lot can carry on putting the food on the table, there's no substitute for face-to-face -face trading and dealing with people direct. It's that's what the, that's what's good for the soul. Jim, thank you very, very much. I'm very pleased to know that we're going to have many more years of connoisseur models and new kits to look forward to, and we really appreciate you doing an evening with. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I have really enjoyed it. Thank you.